Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Does anyone here have an explanation for this? I've only told a few friends this in recent years and none have an explanation. I don't believe in anything supernatural, but at this point I'm willing to accept anything that can remotely explain it. Be me, junior year. Live in a small town in the southern US. House right next to a large wooded area. Stay up late talking to friends on Discord. Around 3 a.m. I decide to get ready to head off. Listen to music before bed on PC. I start to feel uneasy. The feeling like something is watching me which I've never felt before. This uneasiness turns into fear and I take off my headphones. Dead silence inside and outside, not even crickets making noise. Loud knocking on the window that scares hell out of me. This wasn't just a bang or two. It sounded like someone intentionally knocking. My desk is set up in front of the window and the force of the knocking shakes my desk. Legit thought my window was gonna break. After a short pause, another loud banging on the window. Nope.png, lay in bed all night refusing to go to sleep. Next night I'm terrified of going to sleep, but I had school tomorrow. Decide to sleep so hopefully I miss whatever the hell was causing that noise. Wake up at 3 a.m. from the banging. This time it's happening on the window next to my bed. The banging doesn't stop this time, it slowly ramps up. Sounds like someone trying to smash in my window, ready to ship my pants. After a minute the noise just stops. Hear deep abnormal breathing outside, like someone huge is breathing right outside my window. This continues to happen, repeatedly for the next week, always at 3 a.m. Don't think anyone will believe me so I stay quiet. Eventually the noise stops after a week. Six months later. It's summer break now. Still think about the noise sometimes. At this point I chalk it up to my imagination. Wake up in the middle of the night. It's the banging again. A constant rhythmic banging noise. Nearly shit myself realizing I didn't imagine it. Decide I need to stop being a wuss and see what's doing this. I wait for it to stop and go away as it does. When I think it's away from the window I move the blinds to see outside. What I see in my backyard makes me nearly punk. It's a skinny white humanoid. It's crawling around on all fours with pure white eyes. It stops and quickly jerks its head to look at me. Thing looks like a demon. GTFO of my room. Run into the living room kitchen area. See the thing from the kitchen window running across the backyard towards the woods. Barely slept for the next month. Never heard from it again after this encounter. I'm back in my hometown for a few months and I lose sleep. Still terrified it'll show up again. The town has grown much bigger now since I left and the woods have been turned into suburbs. Has anyone else ever run into this thing? I know I didn't imagine it. It's a crawler. They go by many different names and there are many legends about them from many cultures. These beings are responsible for a few internet trends, such as the rake. Stories that are authentic and are about skinwalkers, wendigos, rakes, and such are usually stories about crawlers. They are all describing the same thing. I've encountered one personally, and you aren't alone, nor are you crazy. They are abnormally tall humanoid beings, usually about seven to nine feet tall. Limbs are elongated, but about as skinny or skinnier than that of a young child. Their eyes are pitch black voids in the darkness, but also very reflective like that of a cat's eyes in the dark. They are often said to glow because of this. They are capable of running very, very fast. There's no way a human can outrun them. I know this by experience, as it kept up with a car going about 70 miles per hour. They tend to engage in mimicry. They will mimic the sound of crying, laughter, or even entire sentences, typically in an attempt to lure the naive or foolish into the woods. This often happens if said person is alone. If not mimicking, they are known to screech in a very guttural yet pig-like way, often described as having a warble effect to it. They are predatory in nature, but let people get away often enough for thousands of stories to be online. It seems they treat people either as a threat to their territory and at other times as prey. Interestingly, they don't really break into homes as far as I'm aware. Rather, this one was psychologically tormenting you. They seem to enjoy this. 
their presence is very notable. It seems to induce a state of panic and confusion. The senses such as hearing seem to become depressed. Insects and birds go quiet, and a very deep and overwhelming fear lurks up from within. Likely an instinctual one, a response to some sort of frequency they give off. Back when I was in high school, my friend and I saw something I've begun referring to as a crawler. This was in Rossville, Illinois. Nighttime and in a cemetery. I think it was probably late summer or early fall because I don't remember it being too cold out. Would have been around 2010. Pretty sure the moon was full or close to it because visibility was pretty good. My friend and I used to walk this loop. We would leave her place and go down a block to a side road that led to a park. We would then turn left and cut across the park to the side entrance of the cemetery. The cemetery and park sat at the very southwest corner of town. Beyond that were just woods and cornfields. If we went straight across the cemetery, it would take us to another side road that then led to the main street, back to where her house was. We made it to the cemetery and were walking the main drive that split the property in half. There was a sudden noise that made us both stop. My friend started laughing nervously and asked if I had heard the noise. I told her I had seen what made the noise. To our left, I had seen something running behind the headstones. It was on all fours, but humanoid. It had extremely pale skin and no hair and looked very thin. I remember it was so pale it almost reflected the moonlight. It moved so fast, too fast for any human I've ever seen on their hands and feet, that I couldn't see many details. It was in total profile, so I never saw the facial details. The way it ran was animal-like as well in that it had that gait where its feet came forward almost between or past its hands. Watch a video of a big cat or wild dog running to see what I mean. We were both terrified. We just stood there panicking and listening to it moving around, just out of sight, while we called one of her friends to come meet us and take us the rest of the way home. Her friend arrived and naturally wanted to stay in the cemetery and goof off for a while. For some reason, with him there acting dumb, it was less scary, but I remember it just kept making these wide circles around us. It always stayed out of sight, but you could hear it as it moved. Occasionally, it would come a bit closer, then seemed to dart further away again. Eventually, we left. I spent a while researching it and even reached out to a paranormal group in Champaign for advice. The guy I talked to had never heard of it but wanted to document what we saw. We met up with him and did an interview, but the group never did an investigation. Fast forward a few years and I'm living in Aurora, Colorado. I met one of my friends in about 2012. We really hit it off because we were into the paranormal. When I eventually told him about what I had seen, his jaw hit the floor. He told me he had seen the same thing and told me his story. He described exactly what I had seen, but he had seen it under a porch while living in Thornton. It was crouched down and squatting. He thinks he startled it while it was eating because he said it was hunched over something it was holding. He claims he comes from a native background, and when we first met his best guess was Skinwalker or Wendigo. But then, and especially now, he said he had doubts about either of those things being the answer. He was dating a girl at the time whose mom claimed to be a medium. She said she thought it was something that someone woke up and that now it was angry. We both have serious doubts about that one. The stranger part came when he and I brought it up. We both started having very intense nightmares about it. His were worse than mine and lasted much longer. This was also punctuated by six months filled with a lot of bad luck and anxiety for us. I always sort of brushed this off as us just psyching ourselves out until I sent my story into a podcast. After it was read, another listener sent in their story. They described what my friend and I had seen and also described the sightings as being punctuated by nightmares. I couldn't write that off because he spoke about his nightmares in detail, and they matched my friend's nightmares exactly. I have never given out details of what actually happened in either of our nightmares. I've read a ton of other stories by other users and people on the internet. I've dug through mounds of lore and cryptid lists. I still don't feel like I have an answer to what this thing is. My best guess at this point is that the nightmares aren't coincidental and that this is interdimensional. It seems like it can interact with physical things around it, but I've never heard anyone give a first-hand account of being physically attacked or even touched. I've speculated on what it could be for hours, and the only conclusion that I've come to is that I don't feel like there is an actual concrete answer. It doesn't act exactly like this or that cryptid. 
I think it might be something that's been around and inspired other cryptids and paranormal tales. Hey, OP. I keep a little notepad with stories about weird sightings. Here's a strange one about what you're calling a crawler. Not sure if you're interested, but in the off chance that you, here it is. I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house one August. We were all between 10 and 15, with me being the oldest. We stayed telling scary stories often, but one night a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house was on a hill. It was in a rural suburb, and the backyard was all thick forest with man-made paths that ran through it. We were in the backyard late one night telling scary stories when we started playing truth or dare. My 14-year-old cousin dared me and my younger cousin to go walk through the forest paths for 10 minutes or so. My younger cousin was hesitant, but I wasn't scared, so we went. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark yet, and we could see enough to not get lost. We were walking through the paths for about five minutes when we decided to make a turn. In the middle of the path was a large dog-like creature, hunched over with its front hands an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so bright white and it was humanoid dog-shaped, with a human-like head but a dog-like body and human hands and feet. It looked right at us before dashing away, in the opposite direction from us. For a moment me and my cousin were frozen, but eventually we started screaming and running back to the house. My grandma heard us and ran outside. I don't remember much here because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly, but I woke up in bed the next morning, so I assumed that I was brought up to the house. All us kids slept in one big room, and the bed I was in was pressed against a big glass window that looked over the backyard. From there I could see my cousins playing outside. I went downstairs to join them, and when I got there I realized they weren't playing anymore. They were running to get my grandma. They had found both of her dogs dead, ripped up. That night we went to bed early. I woke up at maybe two in the morning because I felt something hit my head. I woke up and saw my cousins all sitting on the opposite side of the room, looking in my direction. They were all quiet. My younger cousin nodded his head toward the window and I froze. They all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to the side and I saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed so loud and the thing bolted. We woke my grandma up and told her what we'd seen, and she called the police. But when they showed up, they didn't find anything. I went home later. I still visit my grandma, but I never spend the night anymore. In 2017, my friends and I went camping in the Arizona desert near Sedona at the end of March. We had fallen asleep. I was just like jolted awake, and my response was to immediately pop up and look at my surroundings and that's when I saw it standing about 50 feet from our sleeping bags. It was humanoid, skinny, hairless, and pale in color. At first, we were just looking at each other, and it was still, for probably a good 30 seconds. Then it started moving in very weird ways. My friends were still asleep at this point. Then I started tapping my friend trying to wake her up, and right about that time, one of the guys woke up and jolted up like I did, and just looked straight ahead. And he looked for a second and went, Do you see that? And the other dude woke up, and my friend I was tapping woke up. Everyone looked at it. We were like, What is that? We have to be crazy? Then it quickly moved away behind the rise. So we just sat there for a minute talking about what we saw. We looked at our phones, which started out fully charged, to see the time and two of our phones were dead. Mine had like 10% or so battery charge left, which I thought was weird. The other phones were low too. We all figured it had something to do with the weird stuff that happens around Sedona, possibly vortexes or whatever. I felt scared because what I was seeing was so odd and unexpected, but I don't know that I felt threatened by it either. It was more just like you're minding your own business and then suddenly see a giant spider or snake or something. But after a few minutes, we started hearing coyote-like sounds around us. It was like a large pack of coyotes had surrounded us in all directions. It was so weird. That's when we threw all our stuff in the back of the truck and quickly got there. It never really made sense of what we saw. And at the time, I didn't know anything about things like crawlers and other entities like that. So I really didn't know what to think. 
All right, slash X, slash I have a story for you, so sit a while and listen. This takes place three summers ago during a boar hunting trip, down in a very rural area of the Ozark South. My main reason for sharing this here is that ultimately I don't believe in the paranormal. However, I believe I may have run across something that I couldn't explain, and I want some input. Fair warning, I'm no good at green text. However, I'm not going to assault you with a wall of text. In any case, enough pretense aside. Be back from college and wanting to get out into the woods. Be bored on a Friday night and decide to head out super early for boar hunting with a buddy of mine, JD. JD is an Eagle Scout, not prone to being spooked very easily, and I have been hunting in places ranging from deep south swamps to Alaska. We pack our shit up and leave his place around 12.30 a.m. After stopping for energy drinks and beef jerky, every hunter's best friends, we end up getting out there at around 2.15 a.m., We'd hunted this area for boar many times in the daylight, seen tons of deer, squirrels, and even a baby fawn that fell asleep by the warmth of our car engine once. Basically, a nice place. We pull in off the gravel tract, 40 miles from town and 3 miles from a podunk gas station deer check station. Decide not to screw around in the woods at night. We'd had a mountain lion walk in our tracks on a previous hunting trip. Roll down the windows and try to take a short nap. Instantly, we're hit with this nasty, cloying, sickly sweet odor. I just brush it off going, just some wet deer, haha, should mean our scent won't travel far in heavy damp air. JD just looks at me and says, that smells like death, bro, like a cow that's been out in the sun too long. I launch into a diatribe about him being a gigantic coward and how he should deal with it. In any case, since we don't want either to be mucking about in woods home to mountain lions in the dead of night, or be accused of night hunting by some ranger, we decide to go check and see if the podunk gas station is open. Surprise, JD's shitty old four-banger won't start. Fine, looks like it's a nap followed by hunting while we wait for some toothless mechanic to come jumpstart his car. All the while, this smell just seems to be seeping in through the vents and the cracks in the windows. It gets to the point where I'm actively retching in the car. Enough's enough, and we decide that if something had gone and died, We'd prefer not to be stuck in a gigantic tin can right beside the corpse. We get out of the car, parked in the middle of this gravel parking area surrounded by tall grass on the north side, and woods on all the others. A swamp was to our direct west, full of boar, deer, and critters. As I'm sitting there loading up the magazine to my rifle, JD just keeps scanning the tree line with his eyes. To the Europoors and Northerners. Hunting in swamps is close quarters. We hunt boar with semi-automatic rifles in the south. You want a quick follow-up shot in case the 400-pound ball of muscle with 8-inch tusks decides to charge you from 25 to 30 yards out. Something's got his hackles all up, but I'm feeling fine so I just dismiss it. Anyway, suited up, we make our way down to the small footpath, one or two feet wide, that winds its way down into the swamp. However, reaching the tree line, we just both stopped, staring into the woods for a few minutes before either of us spoke. It was almost like shining a flashlight down a mine shaft, where the darkness sort of dissipated the light. I could feel my skin crawl, and something deep in the hindmost parts of my mind told me just to walk right back to the center of the clearing and wait for light. Nope. So we do what any caveman would have done in that situation. We grunted out a few excuses to preserve our manhood and went and sat down by his car. Like hell, I'm going to bumble through woods with mountain lions, weed growers, and God knows what else at 3.15, by that point, in the goddamn morning. The mood lightened and the smell had seemed to recede a bit, so we just busied ourselves checking our rifles and talking about girls, politics, and history. We're a weird bunch. After a while, the smell started coming back and we began to voice our concern that something that smelled dead was moving around. As the smell starts growing more and more oppressive, I start hearing branches and twigs break in the undergrowth. Whatever it is, it's moving. I don't like that one bit. At this point, I'm thinking it's a mountain lion that's all covered in gore from a recent kill that's about to go full territorial mode. That wouldn't have been out of the question. But it wasn't. As I strained to hear where it was, I noticed that the snapping didn't come from the pat-pat-pat-pat of a four-legged animal. It resembled the crunching of a novice hunter picking his way through the undergrowth. 
My first thought was we either had a ranger with a sick sense of humor, a drug grower with a great sense of humor, or worse, a motherfucking serial killer. Either way, weapons were shouldered, bolts closed on loaded chambers, and lights pointed towards where the sound was. Nothing. It's fucking nothing. Just the smell and a slower now crunch crunch. And it stops. The smell is everywhere now, and whoever it is, is sitting far enough back in the tree line not to be silhouetted by our lights. Smart asshole. No eye shine either, which ruled out just about any animal other than boar, which make enough noise to be easily noticeable. Once again the caveman brain rears up deep within my psyche and tells me, Fire. A fire, you idiot. Build a fire. So what do we do? JD and I built a fire. Throughout this whole affair, other than a few moments we'd been mostly quiet. However, the fire gives us comfort, and whatever it is seems to back off into the forest, if only for a while. As the fire burns hot, we start joking again, having a decent time, convincing ourselves it was only a cougar. However, there's only so much timber in a gravel clearing, and after a while we'd have to venture out of the firelight to keep the fire going. That time came, and as the fire burned down to embers, the smell came back more oppressive than before. And with that smell comes an almost oppressive feeling of fear. Not regular fear, but an intense guttural fear that made your muscles tense, your stomach turn, and your eyes go wide. Every fiber of our being told us to get more wood, to keep the fire high. Only with fire would we survive the night. So we cautiously walked to the closest tree line, barely able to see from the dying light of the fire. We'd been trying to save our flashlights. I was on guard duty, as we figured that my Setme, 308 semi-automatic, would be a better standoff weapon than JD's small carbine. I'm tacticaling the hell out at this point, adrenaline flowing from a profound feeling that something just isn't right. JD leans down into the undergrowth to pick up a stick, reaching into the tree line. He screams and falls backwards while branches break right in front of him. He gets up, freaking out, dusting himself off saying he saw something, staring at him first. Sunken eyes, a thick brow ridge, ashy gray skin. Then it smiled at him. Not so much as smiled, but curled back its lips in a Cheshire grin. We are at NopeCon one, gentlemen. I'm going to ignore the next hour of this hopscotch game of the fire dying, the smell growing more intense. Him, as we call it now, drawing nearer building the fire back up and him retreating back to stay away from the firelight. However, it should be noted that this entire time he was circling us, probing our defenses, seeing if it could find a way to get up close without being seen. By the time 5 a.m. rolled around, we'd exhausted almost all of the dry firewood that wasn't within the tree line, except for the tall grass on the northeast side of the road. We, of course, do what we have to do and slowly pick our way over to the tall grass. By this point I have taped a flashlight to my rifle and switched it on as we leave the fire to get some dry grass. As JD is filling his hands with tinder, I check my right hand side and look down the road. I wish I hadn't. Just as I swing my flashlight over the road, I see him for the first time. It's grayish black with either sloughing skin or matted gray fur. I honestly couldn't tell. It crossed the ten yard wide track which seemed like instantly hunched over, maybe five, five to six feet tall, moving like a gorilla does. It's over. Something in my head just starts screaming, it's over. It knows you've seen it. It's not just being territorial. It's circling like a predator. It is a predator. That feeling hadn't been one of fear, but of impending predation. Somehow, the lower parts of our subconscious had known what was going on long before we did. In any case, we ran back to the fire, popped the dry grass on top and waited for the smell to recede. It didn't. It was close. Very close. And this time it wasn't moving. So we wussed out and got in the trunk of JD's car and listened as it passed behind the front of his car back into the trees. In a burst of brilliance I decide that we either make the three-mile run through dark countryside to the gas station and pray the lights are on. Or, we build a fire big enough that one of the farmers or someone driving the main road can see it. We end up deciding that sprinting three miles through dark countryside, guns on our backs, 
could at the worst get us devoured by him or shot by a terrified farmer. So, we do the next best thing. I pull a small tree out of the ground. I'm not talking about a bush. I'm talking about a small eight to nine foot tree. It's amazing what adrenaline can do for you. So much adrenaline where your facial muscles are drawn tight and your eyes dilate to being nearly black. JD's description of my face. In any case, the fire burns bright, very bright after a while and he retreats further into the woods. This tree burned for a long ass time. Eventually, maybe 30 minutes after throwing the tree on the fire, three lifted trucks come barreling down the road and fly into the gravel parking area. The first truck had an obscene amount of those off-road lights on the bull bar and roof, which lit up the whole glade like the sun. The smell almost goes away entirely, still there, but almost imperceptible. No one gets out of the first truck. A man wearing a National Guard t-shirt and ACU pants hops out of the second truck with his hand on his hip, concealed pistol. He questions us for about ten minutes, makes us disarm, clear our chambers, and set our rifles in JD's car. He tells us there's a burn ban, we shouldn't be out here camping around, etc. We explained our car died when we came out hunting, and made that as a signal fire. He just looks at us strangely at the word hunting. Walks back to truck number one, comes back, tells us not to come back there unless we have all of our ducks in a row. Truck three drives over and a man hops out to jumpstart our car. I shake his hand and thank him profusely, and he gives me a worried but sympathetic look. He doesn't say much but walks back to his truck and drives away. Truck two drives away shortly thereafter. Once we've got all of our shit packed up, Truck one's window rolls down and a rather fat man in a polo calls me and JD over. There's no boar here, boys. If you're hunting for boar, you best be looking further on down the road. At least on the other end of County Redacted. Bullshit. Tons of boar in there. But I don't say that. I'm not going to mouth off to the hillbilly militia that just saved my life. So I thank him for his advice. JD and I get back in his car debating whether he had gone away with all the commotion. Just as soon as Fatty McLightbar had pulled out, the smell returned yet again. Nope, we're out. Hop on the gravel road, drive to the highway, drive past a few farms, and make our way towards the western border of County Redacted. We notice we're being followed by a small white Honda. Guess who's sitting in the front seats? Fatty McLightbar and Hillbilly Militiamen. They follow us all the way out of that county, then turn around. So ends my experience. It's hard to get green text to express emotion, the exact description of the smell, or the fucking primal fear we felt. I wrote an after-action report of sorts the morning after that hunt, but haven't been able to find it after I moved, hence the green text. In any case, I've debated going back with more than two people to hunt him, but I'd like to know what exactly I was dealing with. This is of course not touching the fact that the hillbilly militia patrol seemed to know more than they were letting on. Encountering one is a form of fear, dread, and terror I doubt you have ever experienced. I wholeheartedly would not recommend an encounter. The one story I read of an individual who gathered a well-equipped group to go hunt one resulted in injuries and the individual being traumatized. I understand that, though I would not say I was traumatized, I had the luxury of the safety of a car. This being is through and through supernatural, I was lucky enough that it had not decided to mimic or make sounds that would have been terrifying. The only thing I could say of its weakness is that it might be rather fragile. But it's tall, easily one of the fastest creatures on the planet, can mimic loved ones and human voices, will stalk you, and the truth is, it seems ideal for hunting people. If you plan to encounter one, it's easier than you suspect, but no, any sort of plans or backups you may have for the encounter will be performed under a state of extreme mental distress that no human being is really capable of handling for any extended period of time, and I say that with combat veterans in mind. My encounter convinced me of the supernatural, that God is real, and pure evil does exist. These things are horrible, and I hate them. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.
Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.